trying to say to churches, whenever you come to preach and you're not the, uh, the permanent pastor, so you don't know exactly everything that's going on, what the needs are, but you have to say something. So what do you say to a church like this, especially one that's uh, been doing business here for 119 years? At least that's what I saw on the website. 119 years. Even got a historical marker out there to prove that you've been in business for a little while. So in other words, you've been doing church for a long time. What do you say to a church like that? Well, I don't want to stand here and, uh, you know, this sacred desk, this pulpit here, and I'm sorry, but I still think of Roy whenever I think of this. What do you say to people like you? Well, you know, it's, it's never been my intention to be a kind of pep rally preacher. I, I've never been that way, you know, when these kinds of rah, 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 and uh, sis, boom, ba, let's get together, uh, this, that, and the other. You know, especially the let's fight, let's fight, let's fight, you know. Goodness knows, we Baptists, we, we've been doing that fighting for years. So, you know, there's, there's no reason to try to encourage people to, to do those things. And uh, I, I do not plan to uh, provide uh, prescriptions for prosperity. Uh, I will leave that to our better known brothers, Osteen, Hen, Copeland, Dollar, and Crouch. So if you want to watch those guys and figure out how to get all the money in the world by just giving them money, then you go right ahead and, and do that. But uh, I think if you just do a quick read of the four Gospels, you're going to find that there's not a lot in there about material success, about how people just got rich over and over again. Again, it's there, but you're not going to find it on a consistent basis. Success is fleeting. And these quick fixes that we come up with often don't last. I would prefer, rather, this morning to try to challenge you, to uh, push you, you might say, Someone might even have to drag toward a little bit more, a point beyond where you are now as Christians. I mean, it's either that or, or just sit down. You know, if we're not going to move forward, let's just sit down and forget the whole thing. But then throwing in the towel, which is what is often the, the metaphor or the, the image at least, for giving up, throwing in the towel is not something that we should do because Christians have been given the towel, the towel of service to serve the Lord and to do the things that he wants us to do. So I'm, I'm back to where I started. What am I going to say? Well, I'm just going to say two words to you. Follow me. Follow me. Now, if you're thinking I'm saying follow me, you misunderheard me. Those are the words of Jesus. When he said, follow me, then we should be about the business of following him. Jesus put those two words together, not once, but often. Just listen to a smattering of those references. Matthew 4, 19. You're not going to have time to look it up, so just listen. Matthew 4, 19. Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Matthew 19, 21. If you wish to be complete, go and sell your possessions. Give to the poor, you will have treasure in heaven, and then come, follow me. Mark chapter 2, verse 14, as Jesus passed, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting in the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me, and he got up and followed him. Luke 9, 23, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. John 12, 26, if anyone serves me, he must follow me, and where I am, there my servant will be. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. What Jesus said to his followers and to us as we listen to these words again are words of both invitation and command. They are simple. They are rather plain. They are easy to understand. Follow me. But they are also disturbingly personal and exceptionally difficult to obey. These words are printed on every page in the New Testament, whether or not those two words are actually printed there or not. They're all calling us to follow Christ. These words are no respecter of a denomination. 
Jesus wants His followers to follow Him regardless of what church they may attend. Methodist, Lutheran, Nazarene, Catholic, Baptist, whatever it is, if you belong to Christ first, it doesn't matter what church you belong to, you should follow Him. Those are the important things that He's trying to say here. They, they don't bow down this command to, to follow him. It doesn't bow down to people with secular privileges. The President of the United States, if he knows the Lord, is to follow the Lord. The Governor of Texas, if he knows the Lord, he is to follow the Lord. It's not a matter of rank as well. You can be a four-star general, and you still, if you're a believer, are to follow the Lord Jesus. Simple words, follow me. And yet those two words are powerful enough to keep us, this church, in line with how God wants us to live. So when Jesus says, follow me, uh, the question I want to raise right after that is, okay, why? Let me offer you three reasons why you should be following Jesus. First, anyone who says, follow me, is a leader. They're a leader. I mean, you, you can't say, follow me, if you're not a leader, a commander in some ways. That's what Jesus is saying. Follow me. I'm the leader. I mean, don't we all need a little direction in our lives? Don't we all need a little guidance as to which road or which path we should take so that we get the right pastor for this church someday? You want to go down the right road to find that person. You know, you don't want to go off here if the Lord's leading here. We follow Him because He's the leader. So don't be threatened by these words, either as a church or as an individual. If you as an individual say, I will follow Him, I will follow Jesus, then you have to be confident and not afraid that Jesus is going to relocate you to outer Mongolia. Or maybe worse, Pandale. I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said that, should I? Um, it, it, the only relocation project that Jesus is going to bring about in your life is spiritual. He is going to take you to a higher plane, a higher level of knowledge and discipleship. You may be somewhere else, but what matters is you're being elevated spiritually as the Lord leads you. Remember, he's a leader. He is going places. It doesn't sound th so threatening after all if you're following Jesus. We want to follow people who know where they're going. Not like the IRS agent or IRS uh, employee who I read about a few months ago lost his agency's computer. It's a laptop that he was carrying. Uh, according to an IRS spokesman, it contained, quote, sensitive personal information. Well, duh. Laptop computers, if you got mine, it would have sensitive personal information on it. And this was about 201 workers, IRS workers, as well as job applicants, people who were applying to work for the IRS. The spokesman, uh, speaking, of course, on behalf of the uh, IRS uh, person who lost his laptop, said, well, he checked it in, his, in baggage before he jumped on a flight to a job. Now, I carry my laptop every time I get on an airplane. Folks, I don't check that baby in luggage. I carry it on. You don't check a laptop in the baggage. And yet this guy did it before he gets on board a commercial flight and he never saw it again. The bad news is this. The computer had unencrypted names, birth dates, social security numbers, and fingerprints of at least 100 IRS employees and those applicants who were trying to get on board with the IRS. The good news was no tax return information was lost. That kind of disappointed me. I was hoping mine might get lost and they wouldn't be called, you know, well, I'm sorry, no, sir, we lost your taxes. You don't have to pay anything this year. Yeah, right. <laughs> Generally speaking, you don't want to follow someone who gets lost easily, do you? 
You don't want to follow someone who doesn't know where they're going. And maybe you would prefer not to follow someone who might, uh, oh, let's just say, lose your name, birth date, social security number, and fingerprints. That's why you don't want to follow somebody else. You want to follow Jesus. Good news, Jesus is the man with the plan. He's the man with the plan. And his plan is redemptive. His plan is to redeem this world and the world to come. See, our prayers shouldn't necessarily be, not necessarily be, for a longer life. Oh, Lord, let me live to be 85 or 90 or 100 or whatever the case might be. It, it is not necessarily, necessarily, hear me say that, for a longer life but rather, as the old song says, that we might have a closer walk with him in the years that God gives us. Experiencing every day his presence, his peace, and his power. A second reason you should follow Jesus is this. Anyone who says, follow me, and I love this one, is more interested in the future than in the past. More interested in the future than in the past. I, I don't know how, if, if that has registered with you, but it seems to me like on this day and age, loyalties to the past are in the past. You know, people just aren't loyal to much anymore. And that includes churches. Never will forget the guy that came up to me one day and said that, um, this was at another church, and said, you know, we've looked around and we've tried several different churches. We thought we'd give yours a try. Gee, thanks for the loyalty, my friend. Loyalty, whether it's cars or cameras or churches, loyalty is not the norm nowadays. For the 2015 model year, I'm talking about automobiles, there were 33 winners who were honored for automotive loyalty at, I'm going to have to read this, the Automotive News World Congress, which was held in conjunction with the North American International Auto Show. Would you like to know who the winners were? I have four of them I want to mention to you. There were a ton of them, but there, I want to at least mention four. And we're talking about consumer loyalty to these cars, okay? The, the overall loyalty to a manufacturer not, not a make, but a manufacturer. Overall loyalty of people like you and me to a car manufacturer. Any guesses as to who won that? Who, 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 who among us are more loyal to this uh, company than any? Now the other one. I heard Chevy. Chevy is a part of what? GM. General Motors. Overall loyalty to the GM manufacturers, number one. Now, overall loyalty to a make. Now, this is like, you know, if GM is the big guy, then Chevy or, or Pontiac or whatever it is, like the GMC, those kinds of things. So which of the makes do you think people were more loyal to than any other? Ford. And they were a repeat, by the way. They were the, it was the same way in 2014. Ford, and you thought it meant found on the roadside dead. Uh-uh. Fix or repair daily. Ah, no, no, no. We Ford drivers are loyal. Now, here's one that kind of surprised me. The most improved loyalty to a make. In other words, they were over here, Last year, and now they've risen to be the most improved. Guesses on that one? I don't think you'll ever get this. What? Dodge? Oh, it's over here. Hyundai. Who? Kia? Somebody over here. We've got two over here. What was that? We're not on live TV, are we? <laughs> I can waste time, I suppose. Now here, it's, it's well, not exciting, it's interesting. Tesla. Tesla. Say, so what's a Tesla? I, 
somebody's first name, I think. I don't know what it was. Nicholas Tesla, I guess, and his power with electricity. Now, because I know where I am at the present moment, at First Baptist Church in the big city of Del Rio, Texas, I decided I'd throw this category in as one of the 25 or 30 that I could have used. The luxury, traditional, full-size car. Who had the most loyalty? The luxury, traditional, full-size car. Lincoln. What else? Cadillac. Buick? I mean, Buick. You go. No, it's, you go somewhere else. Come on. Uh, that's closer, BMW. Mercedes-Benz S-Class. Mercedes-Benz S-Class. I saw about 10 of them when I pulled up out here. That's the reason I wanted to throw this in. Now, Jesus is unmistakably clear. He demands loyalty. Loyalty. And what I have discovered about Jesus, to my great pleasure and satisfaction, is that when he talks about loyalty and following him, he's talking about the future, not the past. With Jesus, it's not where you've been that really matters. It's where you're going. And if you're following him, you're definitely going in the right direction. If you just thumb through the Gospels, you'll find that um, there were very few opportunities where Jesus said, let's dwell in the past. Let, let, let's think about all the bad things that you did. And, and let me just name off all of them here. And I'll tell you bad after bad after bad after bad that you've done. He, he hasn't done that. He, he doesn't do that on a regular basis. Now, there's some of it, again, that's there. For example, in John 8, one of the ones that we think about the, the most... Um, the scripture says, beginning in verse 3, the scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery. And having set her in the center of the court, they said to him, to Jesus, Teacher, this woman has been caught in adultery. In the very act. I've always wondered who caught this. How did they catch this? Did they break in? You know, I mean, and, and what happened to the other guy? We only hear about the poor woman. What about the guy that is participating in this as well? Well, thankfully, Jesus didn't pry into her sordid past and say, I know what you've been doing for the last 60 years or 40 years or whatever it is. He didn't say, I know the kind of lifestyle you've led. Let me enumerate all the people you have been with. He didn't say that. You remember what he said? I do not condemn you. Go and sin no more. Is that a backward look or a future look? It's a future look. In the future, Jesus is saying, I don't want you to be doing the same things you're doing. Change your ways. Change your attitude. From now on, in the future, this is how I want you to live. There, there was another time a fellow by the name of Nicodemus came to Jesus. He was a card-carrying member of the religious right. He was, he was the guy that, uh, you know, it, it's, a, it's by the law. It's, it's by the, the rule book here and the rule book only. And so he came to Jesus at night, the scripture tells us, not wanting to be seen by his, uh, his colleagues, and, and thereby becoming the original Nick at night. And he's trying to maintain this secrecy, but he was completely hogtied by all the religious legalism going on within him. You're trying, trying to figure out all this stuff. Jesus doesn't stop to say to Nicodemus, how can you believe that nonsense? Which is sometimes what we say, or at least we think, when somebody believes this or that, and it just seems crazy to you, and you want to go, why do you believe that nonsense? That's not the way it, it would work. Instead, Jesus was pretty straight up with him. He told him in John 3, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, 
He cannot see the kingdom of God. What Jesus is saying here is that Nicodemus, all these things that you continue to try to do, all these rules, all these legalisms that you keep doing, are not going to make you right with God. It's going to take something else. The legalism, the works you're doing, is not going to put you over the top into heaven. The most important thing, Nicodemus, is to believe. Believe. That's essentially what born again means. It's, it's complicated, but it's essentially accepting and embracing Jesus. Now, you, you want to hear some bad news for those of you who have made that decision some time ago or more recently? Believing in Jesus, you were born again, saved, converted, redeemed, whatever it is you want to call it. You did that. You know, you want to hear some bad news? You're going to fail again. You're going to sin again. Inevitably, you will. Maybe not to the extent that you did before, and certainly not without the prick of the Holy Spirit on your conscience to say, Oh, that, that was wrong. I need, to, I need to bow and confess this sin and claim my forgiveness. You can't just get away with it. But you will sin. You will fail. And what do you do? You reach up. You grab the hand of the Lord Jesus. Let him lead you again into the future following him. The third and final reason for following Jesus is this. Anyone who says follow me must be willing himself or herself to be the norm, the standard the model for following. So why do you need a norm? Why do you need a standard? Why do you need this model out there? Why? So that you can check yourself and see how well you're doing. Um, no person, no believer should ever check him or herself against another believer. And that, that's including the, the pastor or the most righteous person you know. You do not compare yourself to, well, you know, I must be doing pretty good. I don't do what he does, or I have never done what she did ten years ago. We're comparing ourselves to the wrong people. We have to compare ourselves to Jesus. If Jesus says, follow me, he's setting himself up to be the standard. He's basically setting himself up to say, look at me. Look at me. I'm the one you need to get close to. I'm the one you need to adhere to. That's what he's saying. We measure ourselves by him, and we live our lives according to the way he chooses. Now, here's a common sense question. If you're following somebody, doesn't it make sense that the person you're following is at least somewhat ahead of you? Does that make sense? You know, I mean, it, it may be a little bit. I mean, you, you may be almost bumping each other, but that person is ahead of you if you are following that person. That's what's happening here. There's a, there's a distance between Jesus and us, but um, it, it's not a, a spatial difference. It's an eternal difference. He's in heaven. He is God. Thou art not. Don't be thinking that you're going to be God if you follow Christ. We want you to be more Christ-like, but you'll never be Him. God will not somehow absorb you into Him or into Christ. That's because He's the Creator. He made you the way you are. He wants you to be who you are. And to follow him and to serve him that way. Using the mind that he gave you, the individuality that you are, your integrity, all of that remains intact. You follow him as you are. It's important that you continue to be who he made you to be. Two simple words, follow me. They should be the two-word slogan of every person in this auditorium this morning. Every deacon, every Sunday school teacher, everyone who works with a mission group or some other committee, especially the pastor search committee, 
That group of people must follow Christ if we're going to bring the right person to fill this desk in a few months. It has to happen. And, yes, the new pastor. One of the questions you should ask, how are you following Jesus today? Ooh, that would put him on the spot. And if he goes, I, 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 might not be the right guy. That's the problem with most of our testimonies, is it not? Tell us about your, your testimony. Well, back in 1958, I came to know the Lord as my Savior. Awesome. Anything happened since then? You know, it ought to be kind of current as to what's happening. And that's based on this consistent following of Christ. Anytime an action or a decision or a policy is considered in this church, the first thing you all you ought all to think is, will it move us in the direction that we need to go in order to follow Jesus? Now, does that mean that every proposal that is brought before this church is going to find unanimous agreement? Of course not. Did you see the word Baptist outside when you walked in? Do we ever agree on almost anything? No. What? That we do? Uh, yeah, okay, do we agree on everything? No. See, we don't even agree on whether we agree. No, we, we hardly do. I, I don't have this in my notes, but I just feel compelled to, to tell you this. One, one of the churches I served one time, uh, your seats here are, are blue. Uh, back in the day that I was there, uh, and back in the day they built the church, uh, the, the real popular color, I think it was late 70s, the real popular color in churches for carpet and evidently seats and everything was burnt orange. You remember that? Burnt, not orange, burnt orange. Does anyone know what local university team wears burnt orange? The University of Texas. Honestly, if I'm lying, I'm dying. There was a gentleman there who was a graduate of Texas A&M, and when the orange seats went in, he never came back again. <laughs> Sean's going, yeah, that's what he never came back. I didn't believe it. But I asked him, and yeah, he was a little bit put off. I, I'm guessing there was probably something more, but that seemed to be that which, which turned him. Two simple words, follow me. To follow Jesus is to participate in a plan, his plan. It's to meet the future, greet the future with an optimism, an, an eternal optimism that's given only by him. And it's to have a norm a standard, a model of someone you can follow and by whom you can measure your effectiveness as a Christian. I've used the words follow me several times this morning, and I do so because anytime you hear follow me and you know it was Jesus who said them, that creates a little bit of a crisis of faith. In other words, you have to go, okay, am, am I going to put Jesus off and go the way I think I should go? Or will you know, I want to follow Jesus and I want him to take me the way I should go based on what he wants for my life. Your degree of loyalty over the years is crucial in determining which way you will choose. The kind of loyalty that Jesus wants is described in the Old Testament by a <clears throat> rather obscure character. I never really heard of this guy before, but his name is Ittai. I-T-T-A-I. Ittai. Ittai was a soldier, and he was from Goth, which is a, or was then a Philistine city, and even today it's in that area known as the Gaza Strip. They didn't like the Jews then. They don't like them now. But Ittai somehow had a loyalty toward King David. You may remember when King David was attempting to flee from his son Absalom. 
in serious, serious kinds of trouble uh, because of the rebellion that Absalom had started against his father. As King David was preparing to escape from Absalom, he said to Ittai, this is in uh, 2 Samuel chapter 15, What are you doing here, Ittai? Go back with King Absalom. You're a stranger here and freshly uprooted from your own country. You arrived only yesterday. Am I going to let you take your chances with us as I live on the road? Go back. Take your family with you in God's grace and truth. Go with you. So what King David is saying here is, thanks for the help, but you don't want to get yourself killed on my account. Why would you have loyalty like that to me? You've only been here a little while. Go home. Take care of your family. And God's blessings go with you. Listen to Ittai's answer. And as you do, I hope it will inspire in you a loyalty to Jesus. Ittai answered, As the Lord lives, and as my Lord the King lives, surely, wherever my Lord the King may be, whether for death or for life, there also your servant will be. Pray that prayer to Jesus. Let's bow our heads and do it right now. Lord Jesus, wherever you are, wherever you go, whether for death or for life, there also I will be. Amen. We're going to sing a hymn of invitation this morning. And in this hymn of invitation, there are a couple of things I want you to be thinking about. As has been mentioned before, if you do not know the Lord as your Savior, now's the time to get that right. To invite Him into your life, to take control of it, and to say to Him, I think it's as simple as saying, Lord, I'm following you today. I'm giving who I am, all I have, to you. Again, chances are most of you have made that decision to follow Christ. And so now... It is about saying, wherever you are, wherever you go, wherever you lead, even if I die in the process of following you, I will go. Are you willing to say that? If you are, and you need to make that decision in a public kind of way so your brothers and sisters in Christ will see decisions that you are making, 